From the FJC in Washington, D.C., I'm Mark Sherman, and this is Off Paper. For the past 18 years, Doug Burris has served as Chief United States Probation Officer for the United States District Court in the Eastern District of Missouri. It's safe to say that during that time, he has been one of the most innovative leaders, not just in the federal probation and pretrial services system, but in the federal criminal justice system writ large. His work, in particular on issues of living wage employment for returning citizens, has enabled the Eastern District of Missouri, which includes the city of St. Louis and the entire eastern portion of the state, to achieve remarkable outcomes for individuals on supervised release. Doug is the first federal chief probation officer to have hired a returning citizen to work in the probation office as a community resources specialist. He's also the first and only federal chief to be a member of Harvard Kennedy School's executive session on community corrections. Doug's extraordinary leadership has been recognized by the White House, the Department of Justice, the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, and many other federal, state, and local governmental and non-governmental organizations. This year, Doug will be retiring, so before he rides off into the sunset, I wanted to take this opportunity to pick his brain about innovation and leadership in the criminal justice system. We've got Doug Burris in the house today, folks, and the suspense is killing me, so let's get to it. Doug, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you, Mark, and I must start off by saying two things. One is working with the FJC has been one of the career highlights for me the outstanding people that work for the greater good here. It's just amazing. And the other thing, I really appreciate the fact that you contacted my mother and had her write the opening script for you. (laughs) Thank you, Doug. And the check is in the mail. Um, So, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, So full disclosure to the audience, I am not objective when it comes to your work. Um, And I've sort of had a front row seat for your entire tenure as chief. Uh, and I've really learned a lot by watching you in action. Um, so, you know, to help me prepare for this episode, you were kind enough to send me some ideas about the things you think are important for us to discuss, and you sent them in the form of questions that I might ask you. Um, the first question, and I think it is so interesting that this is actually the first, uh, the first question in the list that you sent me, is what fears do you have for our criminal justice system? So let's start with that, Doug. What fears do you have? Unfortunately, I have several. Uh, The first is the way we continue to measure failure or what we count as failure in our system. The the states and the federal system often use re-arrest rates to determine if someone is successful on supervision or not. Not re-conviction rates, but re-arrest rates. And in my state, Missouri, and I'm sure most other states, there are communities where if you're a person of color, you're much more likely to be stopped and arrested, frankly, than you are if you're a a white person like me. And uh, I'll give you one great example. One of our best successes was a man who had been to prison actually six times, and when he came out, we got him a job with a utility company. He restored his family, his daughter's actually in law school now, he's doing everything right, he has worked at the same job for the last 15 years. One day he was driving through one of these communities and was pulled over. He asked the police officer, why did you stop me? And he said, because you were speeding. And his response was, "Uh, no I wasn't, I'm driving my company utility truck, let me show you the GPS to show you that I was actually going five miles under the speed limit. He ended up in handcuffs on the sidewalk and the officer did a search of the utility truck where he found a a knife, a putty knife, in the toolbox in the truck and he charged him with possession, arrested him for possession of a dangerous weapon. He he went, he booked out, the the charges were never formally filed, but on paper that man is a failure when he is one of the greatest successes of our community that we're extremely proud of. I I think we need to get way past this judging success based on re-arrest. And there are people that stumble, that, that uh, may get a DUI or, or something like that. But, you know, if they're not, if they're not harming the community, uh, if they're not doing anything, if they're not dealing kilos, 
and they're coming home from a, a celebration at work or something like that, I don't think that's a failure either. So I think we've got to be much more open as to what we judge success as. The, the second thing would be, I think from time to time our system has what's called a flavor of the year uh, product where we really get excited about one thing and it becomes everything and that's what we concentrate on. And uh, I, I think that perhaps we're, we're getting a little too excited about an in-depth cognitive skills program at the expense of other things that have proven to work, uh, just standard drug treatment, uh, employment, many, many other things, just simple basic assistance. And this really scares me that, that we continue to fall into that trap. And then the final one is the funding for the halfway houses. The, the statistics show that people are significantly more successful when they transition through a halfway house having been released from prison. And it gives them the support and the opportunity to adapt to the community without just being dropped on the streets. And they are, the Bureau of Prisons is closing halfway houses across the country, and that's going to result in more reincarceration. And there's no way around it. So um, those are three very meaty issues. When you're talking about, now you are the chief of the district that includes Ferguson, Missouri. Yes. So, and, and I know from conversations that you and I have had uh, over the past couple of years, um, that that is also an issue um, or a situation which has really raised uh, this issue of how we measure recidivism using re-arrest rates versus reconviction rates. Um, in large part, your concern is that the sort of the disparate impact um, of using rearrest versus reconviction, or or perhaps other more accurate types of measures. So, can you elaborate more about that? Yes, and I, I have to say, with Ferguson, when that happened, I wasn't surprised, and I didn't think, "Well, why did this happen?" My honest response was, "What took so long?" Yeah because I had seen so many of these communities that, that target the, the poor and the minorities. And it, it was shocking to me that, frankly, that it took so long. So uh, the, you look how the, they set up a system in Ferguson, and, and not just Ferguson, but many surrounding communities. And I'm sure, again, it's like this in different parts of the country, mm -hmm. where they, they fund the entire government based on targeting people that don't have the money to pay fines. And what it, it does is it just sets up failure for their entire community. You know, uh, as you're talking, one of the things that occurs to me with all three of these fears that you've articulated, um, and again, this is something that we've talked about, is that in some ways they represent perhaps a disconnection between what practitioners like yourself see at at the ground level, working in the district on a day-to-day -day basis with your team of officers and staff and other stakeholders in the community, and policies that are made uh, at, in here, sort of in Washington, or um, procedures and policies that are developed sort of at the 40,000-foot level, uh, where everybody is working with the best of intentions. But what you're seeing and what perhaps you're colleagues at the ground level are seeing is something different than what we're seeing perhaps here at the 40,000 foot level. And would, would you agree with that? Would you disagree with that? What are your thoughts? I, I, I totally agree with that, Mark, and I think that's a great observation. I, I have to start out here by saying that I believe in punishment in the right circumstances. And in fact, it was my fourth month on the job where I started in Oklahoma when the Murrow building blew up. And I walked around the Murrah building, and I saw the devastation that it caused. And this I, is the Oklahoma City bombing you're referring yes, to. Yes, huh? yes. And I, I have seen evil unlike most people, and it still affects me today. I have seen people that have done horrendous things that need to go, go away to prison forever, and I have not lost sleep over that being a part of it. But when we're punishing people for money, and try, just to try to take their money that they don't have, uh, this is just a horrendous thing that does no good for anybody. What do you think, um, if, there is, if you do agree with this disconnect between sort of the, 
the Washington policy making and regulatory community and sort of the ground level law enforcement, probation and pretrial community and relevant stakeholders in your district and in other districts, what would you recommend um, that, that can be done to sort of perhaps narrow that disconnection or eliminate that disconnection? What, what can we do in Washington to bring us perhaps a little bit closer to a better understanding of what happens at the district level? I, I don't know if it could happen, but the, my dream answer would be that include people who are being affected by the decisions and making the decisions. And, and they can help steer you. They want better communities. They want better lives for their children. They want, we all want the same thing. Uh, but when they're not included in making those decisions that affect them, they are going to not want to participate in the community. And, and then that's where we have people that start dealing drugs and doing other things. We have to be more inclusionary in including the people uh, that, that will be impacted by decisions made by policymakers. Chief U.S. Probation Officer Doug Burris from the Eastern District of Missouri is my guest. We'll be back in a moment to talk about the challenges of being an innovator, as well as innovations occurring in the criminal justice system that Doug thinks warrant close observation. So don't go anywhere because we're just getting warmed up. This is Off Paper. Excellence. What does it mean for a probation officer and a pretrial services officer? It's just a word, really. But we put it on a pedestal. And when we do that, excellence seems out of reach. Something that only the privileged few, that only the golden boys and girls can achieve, while the rest of us just stand by watching. But that's not right. It can't be. For all it takes to be an excellent officer is to be a competent officer. And all it takes to be a competent officer is knowing how to make decisions confidently, knowing how to analyze facts, policies, laws, and situations critically, knowing how to get up every morning ready to just lead from where you are and make a difference. You don't need a fancy title. All it takes is knowing how to investigate matters objectively and how to plan proactively. All it takes is knowing how to bounce back from a really bad moment and be resilient, and knowing how to be aware of your role as an officer. All it takes to be a competent officer is to supervise individuals in ways that will help them succeed. All it takes is to be a team player and to manage your work. That's it. We are all capable of achieving excellence. All of us. Learn more about the Federal Probation and Pretrial System's Charter for Excellence and the FJC's competencies for experienced U.S. probation and pretrial services officers at fjc.dcn. Welcome back. I'm talking with Doug Burris, Chief United States Probation Officer for the Eastern District of Missouri. Doug, so let's talk about innovation in criminal justice, since that's one of your favorite topics and uh, one of my favorite topics, too. Uh, you've been at the forefront for many years now, uh, and I think one of the things for listeners to keep in mind is that it takes a fair amount of courage to innovate because innovation means risking failure. It also means disrupting the status quo, which can result in conflict with folks who like things just the way they are. Thank you very much. Can you talk about what that's been like for you, perhaps especially when you were in your first few years as chief, maybe provide an example and what you've learned? Well, at times people that have loved it, loved the system because it, we were doing what we always have, uh, they thought that I had lost my mind with some of the decisions that I had made. And, uh, but there has been so much, that is one of the more exciting things I can tell you that I see for our system is there is some innovation going on. And what I think is beautiful I, is that it is by both parties. Uh, right on Crime, I think, is a wonderful organization that has really done some remarkable things uh, with, the, with various state legislators in 
producing outstanding results. And this is a coalition of conservative uh, policymakers and legislators, both state and federal, who have come together on criminal justice reform. Right, and again, producing amazing results. Mm -hmm. it, so it, it's real exciting to see organizations like that really lead the way for us. Uh, the, the other thing I would have to say with innovation is that I've been thrilled with has been the outcomes of the Second Chance Act. And I can just share some personal examples. Before we had the Second Chance Act, we did not have the ability to fund for bus passes, job training, anything along those lines. Uh, but if someone didn't have a job and didn't report, we had funding for guns, vests, and government vehicles to go arrest them for not working and not reporting. But now we, we have funding for appropriate use of, of people that are ready to change and take advantage of hope and help. Uh, here's how innovative it could get. We had a man who was released from prison and after he'd served 10 years, but he developed sleep apnea while he was in prison and he couldn't pass a physical, um, previously he was, had a commercial driver's license and drove a truck for a Fortune 500 company and they were willing to hire him back, uh, but he couldn't pass the physical. Uh, we, through second chance funding, we were able to get him a, a CPAC machine, which totally fixed his sleep issue and this man has a great career and is taking care of his family and he's a, I wish he was my next door neighbor. He's, he's what we should all strive to see when people get released from prison. But when you back, go back to the old days where we didn't have money for bus passes or anything like that, we had to hold bake sales in the federal courthouse to try to fund programs to do innovative things and produce some amazing results. But the Second Chance Act is the most exciting piece of legislation I have ever seen during my career. All right, so let me take you back to the days of yore. Before the Second Chance Act, you were a relatively young man coming into the Eastern District of Missouri as chief after working for just a few years uh, as an officer in, an, in another district. You're coming in, you have all these great ideas about the things that you want to do, all of these innovations that you want to implement. And you did not have the policy support that you have now um, via the Second Chance Act and that, and that other chiefs have now via the Second Chance Act and other uh, judiciary policies and that kind of thing. So w when you think back to those early days of when you were chief and the, the innovations, whether it was an internal innovation within your probation department or what I would refer to as an external inno innovation, meaning designed to help the uh, individuals either on supervised release or on probation. What are one or two of the things that really stick in your mind as things that were difficult to do, uh, but things that worked out beautifully and, and, and were worth taking the risk? I, I think that some of the greatest successes we've experienced in the district have come from some of my worst failures. And I, I can think of the simple uh, uh, event that happened I, I know that em employment has a great effect on people staying out of prison and, in, and, and also lowering crime rates. Uh, the Father Greg Boyle, out of, uh, who runs the largest gang uh, intervention program in California, has a saying, nothing stops a bullet like a job. This and is Homeboy Industries, right? Correct, mm -hmm. correct. And he, he, that, that is so true. And I believed, my first week on the job, I said, we're going to find extremely high paying jobs for people and there'll be no crime. Uh, so we actually met with a, a large automotive manufacturer who agreed to experiment and hire some of our people. So we had four people that were hired and started on the same day and within a month, three had quit mm -hmm. or didn't show up. And that's, that was completely my fault because we didn't ask them, would you like to work, do this type of work? What, what are your interests or anything like that? And so others said, well, maybe we should just ask if, you know, what, what, before we start placing them in specific positions of what type of work. And we've taken that a step further by doing a vocational assessment on them uh, that will help them identify things too. But simply asking, 99% of the time they're going to come up with something that is obtainable, that is realistic. And then you're going to have that 1% that either want to be a, a rap star or run a club, uh, but uh, uh, they can do that part-time. So again, some of the, the greatest failures that, that I've had personally have resulted in others cleaning up my messes and taking us to the, to the next level. 
and it was a lot of begging off the back, uh, uh, right off the bat when I started because there was no funding mm -hmm. and we had to ask for favors and um, appeal to the, the goodness of, of people's hearts. But what we found that surprised me perhaps the most, when we approached some employers about hiring our folks, uh, they would say, look, I got a cousin in prison, or my son has done time, or my daughter, because of a mental health issue, ha has been in jail. Uh, if you've got people that you will promise that will show up and be drug free, we're willing to give them a chance. And I shouldn't have been surprised by that because statistically, one out of every 15 people in the United States will serve a prison term. Not a jail term for a DUI or anything like that, but a felony conviction resulting in a prison term. So it was the law of averages that these employers are going to have some personal experience. So in terms of federal probation and pretrial and the criminal justice system generally, why do you think it's so important for leaders to take risks? Uh, when I think about this, Doug, the first thing that comes to mind is your hiring of Clark Porter, uh, a man who served time in federal prison for armed robbery, to work in your department. Um, on the surface, at least, to a lot of people, that just seems like a crazy risk to have taken. But that huge risk has turned out beautifully. So can you provide some insight into your thinking about risk-taking as a criminal justice leader? I, I think one of the, what helped me the most with this, perhaps, was the leadership development training I underwent with Michael Siegel. And he taught me that it, there's a difference between management and leadership and you can manage money but you have to lead people and so I, I remain thankful for that so you have to be bold and move forward and if you and if you look for the leaders that you have personally admired they have taken chances and they have been brave so when it came to the hiring of Clark Porter uh, he was a man who served 15 years on a charge of robbing a post office, which he got about $660 from. He was 17 years old and went through the federal system because it was a post office. He actually received a 35-year sentence, but he committed this crime about a year before the guidelines came out, so it was not uh, the truth in sentencing that we, we have today. Right, this was before the implementation of the Sentencing Reform Act. Right, that, yeah. right. Uh, the when he came out, uh, he was just a star when he would come and I would see him present and do other things. Actually, the day I met him was the day he uh, graduated from college when he showed up at my door in a cap and gown with his probation officer. And he, he uh, had his degree in his hand and his officer uh, said to me, you, you need to meet Clark, he's got an amazing story. And his story was beyond amazing, frankly. He grew up in total... Uh, poverty with a mother who was illiterate and a father who was absent. His siblings were all taken from her because she was unable to care for them. And he basically lived on the streets, dropped out of school at a very young age, uh, and then robbed a post office with a, another man who was 29 years old, uh, and then went away to prison forever and ended up at Marion, the prison that replaced Alcatraz, where there have been more murders than any other prison in the federal system. And he had someone that changed his life by taking an interest with him. And every time I heard Clark's story, it made me realize that you should never underestimate the power you give someone by treating them with dignity. And you, you should also respect the fact that by believing in someone can produce some incredible outcomes. That's been the way with my personal life, with most of the people I know. The people on our caseloads are no different. But a man talked him into taking his GED. Clark thought he was incapable of passing, but he did. He came out, he got into Washington University, a school my SATs would not allow me to get into, mm -hmm. and then ended up getting his master's degree. Uh, and he, he was doing just some remarkable things. Uh, it seemed to me like a no-brainer, but many others thought otherwise, including on my staff. I actually had my own personal staff uh, talked to a marshal's member saying, do you realize we got this guy coming in who had robbed a post office and now he's going to have access to all these guns here? Which, of course, that was not the case whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And and unfortunately, the, the judges had to get involved in our courthouse and say, no, this, this man's deserving of a second chance. Of course, I didn't hire him without talking to our bench 
and the chief judge, Carol Jackson, was fully aware of everything, and she's the real hero of this story, giving us the, the authority to hire Clark. Fortunately, she had seen Clark speak previously and, and knew what would happen, but he, he has done an amazing job and has changed more lives than probably most 10 probation officers you could find together. You're listening to Off Paper, the criminal justice podcast from the FGC, and I'm talking with Chief U.S. Probation Officer Doug Burris, who, after 18 years as a criminal justice leader, will be retiring shortly. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, I'll ask Doug about some of the challenges criminal justice leaders are currently confronting and how leaders should measure success. I'll also ask Doug to offer some advice to new leaders as they take the reins. Stay with us. Back in a moment. When it comes to making a recommendation and decision about whether to release or detain a defendant charged with a criminal offense, two actors in the federal courts play key roles. The pretrial services officer who conducts the investigation, assesses the defendant's risk, and develops a report containing the recommendation. And the magistrate judge, who knows the law, evaluates the officer's report and recommendation, and makes the release or detention decision. In an effort to assist officers and judges in keeping up with the latest legal and practice developments and empirical research relevant to pretrial work, the FJC is pleased to offer pretrial decision-making for magistrate judges and pretrial services officers. FJC educators and peer faculty facilitate this one-day in-district program. The curriculum provides opportunities for scenario-based experiential learning and interactive discussions among judges, officers, and faculty focusing on topics such as the Bail Reform Act, evidence-based pretrial risk assessment, and alternatives to detention. In-district delivery of the program allows it to be customized to the needs of the district. For more information, just go to fjc.dcn's Probation and Pretrial Services Education page and click on In-Person and Blended Programs. We're back with Doug Burris. Doug, with your impending retirement, you're now in a position to look in the rearview mirror a little bit at the criminal justice system and take some stock. We've already talked about some of the things you've, you've been able to accomplish as a leader and innovator. So now I'm wondering how you see the challenges still facing the system, what they are, and if you could choose only one thing about the system to change, what would it be? That is a loaded question. <laughs> and unfortunately, what mine, the one thing I would like to change about our system would have to change the entire country. And that is the, the new group of people we're bringing in, the millennials, um, to the workforce. Talk a little bit about that. I think that's of concern to a lot of leaders in the criminal justice system and in leadership and management generally. You can't, you know, a day does not pass where you don't see an article in something like the Harvard Business Review or any sort of uh, media that managers and leaders tend to read or look at or listen to uh, where there is not some discussion about the challenges that millennials are posing uh, for managers and leaders. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, the millennials I have found um, in most cases are a little more self-serving. Um, it's they want to know what the the job can do for them instead of what they can do for the job. And they also want instant gratification. In fact, I think some believe that instant gratification takes too long. Uh, but uh, I, I remember one person that we brought into a position who on her third day came in to talk about a promotion. Mm. Uh, and this is someone that didn't even know all the hallways in the building just yet. But uh, I have to tell you, there there is some good in them, um, and that is that they do take feedback well. Uh, their IT skills are significantly better than what the, my generation has. But I think they're just ex there's an expectation to be more occlusionary with them. Listen to what they say, ask what they're going through, things along those lines. And I've, ha I've had some great successes without any doubt. But it is frustrating when you have someone who wants a trophy for showing up. And that's, that's, that is really, really frustrating. You have to appeal to their passions. They, we all have different passions, without any doubt. But my generation, the, the people I, the most of the people I see in our system, it's they don't care what they get out of life. They care about what they give in their life. 
and it's getting harder and harder to find people who have that same philosophy. So um, it sounds like uh, in addition to with, um, with younger employees coming into the system, you offered some advice, which I think is very helpful, to be inclusive of their views, to solicit their, their input, um, to provide some opportunities for them to show their stuff, right. uh, that kind of thing. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, uh, what other challenges uh, do you sort of see in the system in addition to um, trying to integrate uh, younger employees into, into the workforce? Sometimes I think we lose sight that we have to be focused on diversity every day that we work. Uh, when I started in the system, when, when I started as, as chief, there were only two African American probation officers in the district where I was appointed in a community where it's, that is about 50% African American. And I firmly believe that in order to help a community, you need to look like that community. You need to, need to be representative of that community. It's easy to, to lose sight of that, and it is something that we must think about every single day. Okay, so I hear that a lot from people who are advocates of diversity, and I, I think it's important to try to unpack that a little bit. Um, what, I mean, based on your 18 years of experience just as chief, not including your experience as a line officer, but even, uh, let's talk about that. W w why is it so important for the uh, community of officers to look like the community in which they are enforcing the law? Why, why is, what is, what does it mean to look like that community and why is that so important when it comes to doing the actual work? Well, we could back up to Ferguson and that, use that as an example that. where the the police force in a, a very diverse community, I think around half African American, uh, was mostly white and of course all the leaders in the community were, were white. And it was because of that the, the, the community said enough and you know when they had the whole situation with Michael Brown it wasn't just what had happened to Michael Brown what they were upset about was this could have happened to anyone in the entire community and so that's that's why I think it's important plus I have found if you want to have credibility in a community you've got to look like the community and we didn't have it initially uh, so when you go to a community to help if if you if you have lived on their streets, you have staff members who have lived on their streets, grew up in their communities, they're going to be open, they're going to want to partner, and they're going to work with you towards positive change. So um, it's about, as you say, credibility, yes. right? This person looks like me, therefore they understand me. Right. Is that fair? That's exactly right. All right. So it's not simply about sort of bean counting and making sure you've got the right number of, you know, different minorities on your staff and that kind of thing. That's not what it's about. It's about connecting with the community in a meaningful way that, uh, and doing that by having people on your staff who will be out in the community on a regular basis interacting with people in the community who look like them and therefore the people in the community feel like if, it's a, if we're talking about a probation officer, for example, this probation officer can understand where I'm coming from because he looks like me and perhaps has had very similar experiences to me. Perhaps that probation officer has gotten pulled over by a police officer, you know, when perhaps a, a, a white uh, officer or individual may not have been pulled over in the same circumstance. So that's what you're talking that, about. That right? is exactly right. And that has happened where we've had African-American officers pulled over in these communities where none of the rest of us do, to the point we had to get the FBI involved. So how does that translate into the day-to-day -day work that an officer does? If, so if an officer is out in the community, basically from, is out in the community that is sort of his community or her community, right. how does that translate into, into that officer being a better officer? Well, they have, if they came from that community, they're going to have a much greater passion to do good in the community, to better the community, because that's where they're from. That's who they are. That's where they got their identity. So it, it makes total sense to bring people from that community into the workforce to try to better it. So 
shifting gears a little bit, um, I, I, I want to turn to a couple of topics where your advice might be particularly helpful to newer criminal justice leaders, and some of this we've, we've covered already just through our conversation. And I ask uh, about these because, as you well know, it can get lonely at the top, so to speak, uh, and it can sometimes be very difficult for a leader in any organization to know whether they're on track to succeed. Um, so at least in terms of how things work in the criminal justice system, how does a leader know when he or she uh, is on a successful path? And, and this is something that I think you can speak to very uniquely because you, for almost the enti your entire tenure as chief, you have become known as an innovator, as somebody who is sort of out in front of the curve, um, sort of setting the standard, often that the agencies in Washington have to catch up to, um, and many of the policies that you have implemented in your district have since become part of national policy. So that had to be an extraordinarily lonely feeling for you when you, you've had pushback, you referred to before pushback from your staff about certain innovations, like hiring Clark, uh, and you've had pushback from the top, you know, where your priorities might not have matched the priorities of Washington, and, you know, you've got people pushing back from all different sides, so that's got to be a pretty lonely place to be, um, but you seem to have thrived on it, and, you know, we ha now have a, a large number of newer chiefs in the system. I think they could really benefit from hearing uh, your advice about how to gauge success, especially when one is an innovator and might be sort of uh, challenging the status quo. And I know that a number of the newer chiefs w would like to do that, but there might be some trepidation about that. Yeah, there, there were a few occasions where I wondered what the hell I got myself into. Mm. And I remember not knowing what to do, so I just left the courthouse and went on a long walk and just remembered my first day about what I said I was going to do and I wanted to hold firm to that. The, you, then you have to start really celebrating the successes no matter how small they may seem. But I will tell you that, that two of the best days that I've had in my tenure, uh, one was when a wife of one of my officers came to me to talk and said, before you got here, my husband was mis miserable because it was trail him, nail him, and jail him, and it was all don't help people, catch people. And she told me, with just tears coming down her face, saying, with the changes you've made, he is so much happier, and he is a better husband and a better father now. And that still just touches my heart to this day, and this was probably 15 years ago. Uh, the other thing was, uh, I can tell you that the great ideas typically come from bottom up, not top down. And that's what you really need to look for on how to make changes. I had ideas, but I had no idea how we were going to accomplish all these ideas. And it was my staff who said, he's right, we can have a positive change. And they came up with the idea for the bake sales and doing other things along those lines when we had no money and no funding. They had bought into the vision, and they were the one that was going to carry all of the weight. They found a way to do that. Okay. So uh, what I'm taking away from those two pieces of advice uh, are, um, in terms of starting from the bottom up, um, and this, uh, I think, is something that applies systemically as well as within a department, right? Yeah. So you're talking within a department, talk to your people. Solicit ideas from your people, not unlike what you were talking about with newer employees who are quote unquote millennials. Right. You know, ask them what they think should be done. Yes. Uh, and, and try to take that sort of crowdsource, take that information and develop initiatives from the bottom up that way. That's one thing that you're talking about. Absolutely. Okay. The other thing uh, that you mentioned in terms of celebrating success, um, I think is. Uh, it's a lot less lonely at the top when you are helping people find meaning in their work, right? And I think this is something that, again, not only in criminal justice, but certainly in criminal justice, um, this, is a, this is a problem um, that I think professionals, whether they are probation officers or 
prosecutors or defense attorneys or judges. You know, this is an issue that I think we are having to confront uh, in criminal justice, and it's particularly, um, I think, important in. A, a, a system that's administering justice for the professionals to not lose sight of why they got into the work to begin with. Um, and it sounds to me like uh, with the story of, you know, the spouse of the officer saying to you, thank you so much for the work that you're doing because it's been so inspiring for my spouse. Um, and, and he sees meaning in his work now, basically. Um, this is something that I know that is important to you. You find meaning in your work by focusing on the reasons we do this work in the first place, why we got into it in the first place, and not losing sight of that. And it sounds like for a leader to try to instill and, and that reminder constantly within uh, the rank and file about here's why we do the work, right? And let's do this together. So does that make sense? Absolutely. And when you have, when you are celebrating success, sometimes you're, you're accomplishing multiple goals. For instance, when you have a reentry court celebration, veterans court, mental health court celebration, GED graduation, uh, vocational training graduation, a computer award ceremony, anything along those lines, not only are you celebrating what the transition of the person, but I think you're celebrating the, the outcomes that the officer is producing. Uh, and so you have to just lock onto those great days because you're not always going to have success. So celebrate it while you have it. So one of the things we've been talking about in the system lately, uh, or at least over the last couple of years, though I think this is something that you have known for your entire tenure as an officer, including your tenure as chief, is that officers can be change agents. Yes, right? we absolutely. Hear that, we hear that buzz term a lot lately, but officers can be change agents and you're saying celebrate the success certainly of the client but understand the role of the officer in facilitating or catalyzing that change. That is the most important thing we can do. Everyone loves success and people like being recognized and it might be the the person on our case or the client who is up there in a cap and gown but the officer facilitated that and you need to acknowledge that with with your staff. Doug Burris, I want to thank you so much for this conversation, and I, I think I speak not just for myself, but certainly for the Federal Judicial Center and perhaps even the larger criminal justice practice community in congratulating you on an amazing tenure as chief in Missouri Eastern. Thank you, Mark. Again, it has been a great honor to specifically work with you, but the people of the Federal Judicial Center who, who do amazing things. Off Paper is produced by Paul Vambus. The program is directed by Craig Bowden. I'm Mark Sherman. Thanks for listening. See you next time.